Hi Amanda. We have a good showing tonight. Um, so what questions do we have kind of right off the bat? I might have a hard time like uh, getting access to some of those review sheets, but I think I think I can do it pretty quickly if, you, if there's one in particular or if there's a type of problem you want help with. Oh, that would have been really good to put on this test, but I don't think I have any. Okay, we're good. <laughs> Let me just double check. I should have. Darn it. Well, you can bet it's going to be on the final exam. I still have multiple months to figure out. This is true. Shoot, yeah, I don't have the, uh, there is no PES on the test. Uh. Okay, that's true. I would have to say that even though they added it in, I think it's going to be a minor thing. It might be like one question on the... AP exam, so on my final exam, it would only be probably like one question. Okay. Can you explain the difference between a transition ion and a transition atom? Sure. Um, you have a periodic table in front of you? Yes, I do. Okay. Let me go to this right here. All right, so... um. Let's take a look at um, like vanadium. And so vanadium has 23 electrons. Okay. And uh, its Lewis house structure would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. 4s2, 3d3. Uh, um, so that's that is that its normal thing. Now vanadium can also be vanadium 3 plus, and this is the ion. So now it only has 20 electrons. So when I write the loose out or the not loose out the electron configuration for this. Um, whoops. Um, here's the thing. Actually, here's something I should back up for a second. When transition metals lose electrons, they usually use them, lose them from the S orbitals, the outermost energy levels first. So it's going to lose it from the S first. So you're going to end up with something like that. That would be that would be a viable electron configuration for a V three plus. Would that be a transition ion? Uh, yes. Yeah. See, this is the, this is a right here. This is a transition metal atom. And this is a transition metal ion. Yes, it's um, the way that I understand it is that as you start building up from the electron, like you, you go from the center and then you start adding them. And really, if you guys remember, there's there is these um, the P orbitals are these like kind of dumbbell shape that are the X, Y, Z coordinates. And as it starts filling up, it gets bigger.
And then when it adds the 4S, it's way out here. And then you've got these empty spaces. So then it backfills with the D in here before it gets to the P, which then, because the D is, is inside of here. Now it gets really messy. I can't draw the Ds. But the Ds come in here and they start filling in. I actually make those a different color is what I should do. Three D two for what? For the transition ion. Um, for for vanadium three plus. Yeah, yeah. Because it's lost the four S two, and then also two are coming the V orbital. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. I'm sorry. There we go. So, okay, so the D orbital fills in right here. So it starts filling in these empty spaces in here. I'm not a very good artist. Before it does the, before it goes back and, and puts the P in. So that's why it can backfill. So it jumps out to S and now, but since S is the furthest out now, it's gonna lose those electrons first. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Okay. So just to give you guys an idea of what this test is going to be like, oops, I hate it when it does that. Okay. So for unit one, which was the atom, nuclear chem, etc., we have five questions. For unit two, uh, I think that was, or did we do trends as a part of unit one? I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that so that includes, okay, so that includes nuclear atoms and trends, and unit two. Um, there are four questions. Uh, unit three, there are six questions. Unit two was the stoichiometry, right? Uh, yeah, that sounds right. Stoichiometry. Excellent. Five, eight questions. Unit four, oops, did that backwards. Six, there'll be four questions. So for grand total of, is that 34? No, 10, 15, no, yeah, it's 34. 34. 34 questions. So that'll be like, I can't, uh, if our, if it's almost two minutes per question, you guys have a ton of time. And some of the questions are really easy. Granted, some of them will require some calculations that you'll have to write out, but it still will be, in my opinion, easier. So some of this stuff, like, you know, we've been doing enough work that, you know, these units are kind of re-emphasized with some of the things. Once we get into, um, let's see, six was thermo, so we just had that one. And I graded it and entered it, and I would have to say that on the whole, everyone did a lot better than I expected pretty easy, so I'm hoping that stays kind of fresh. So unit six should be okay. Unit five was the bonding, that was kind of tough. Um, so you'll you know go back and take a look at shapes, make sure you know your shapes, make sure that you understand um, you know, bond length, resonance, sigma pi, hybridization, um, hydrogen bonding. It's difficult to ask questions about you know the types of bonding like you're not comparing the same way you would with a free response on that bonding stuff. But there, that's a question, that was a unit that was kind of tough, but there's a lot of questions there, Lewis dot structures. Uh, and then uh, the fourth unit was the gases. 
And so this one typically is a more difficult unit just because there's a lot of different types of calculations. Um, as it turns out, I didn't realize this, but there is a calculation that I'm gonna have to provide you with the formula for, and that's gonna be Graham's law of effusion. Because I do have one question on there that does that deals with this. Okay. Is that a Say again. Is that a no, nope, that's really just really bad handwriting. Okay. That's an equal sign. Graham's law does not have greater than or e or less than signs in it. So, but the other the other ones you guys will probably be fine with, uh, you know, ideal gas law, combined gas law. Um. So, and you're gonna have to understand, you know, um, the kinetic molecular theory (KMT). Understand that. Uh, let's see what else is in there. Oxidation numbers. Um, oh, tr trans, I just mentioned ion uh, ionization energy is always a big one. Um, balancing equations, I'm trying to think of other stuff. Definitely, in, in, in unit three, that was our solutions unit. And solutions, you know, you're, you're doing, um, you know, actually solutions and stoichiometry are kind of together. There's a lot uh, of overlap there. So just remember that, um, you know, uh, so for unit three, you know, the stuff that you're going to have to know, like the M1 V1 equals M2 V2, and that's dilution, right? When you do dilutions, did you guys remember that? Yeah. Okay. Um, but also, you know, and, and, and I'm going to try to trick you guys, you know, how much water is added to make the solution? So, how much water is added? So that one right there, how much water is added? That's a killer question because when you do the calculation, you go, oh, V2 is, you know, 220 milliliters, but you already had 20 milliliters, so all you had to add was 200 milliliters. So, Exactly. That's exactly right. Um, looks like Katie Lloyd's having a hard time. Darn it. Um, don't forget your. Say again. I said it's not me for once. Yeah, it's not you. <laughs> um, Isoelectronic. You guys remember some of that stuff? Yes. That's exactly right. So, and, and usually it's not that they're, it's not that they're different atoms, it, that it's usually ions. Ions are isoelectronic. I'll just write some of that down. So um, let's pick one. Let's just pick a really simple one. Like um, helium is isoelectronic with um, lithium plus and beryllium two plus, right? So pretty straightforward. Um, there is no paramagnetic diamagnetic on this test. I felt really limited to try to do everything in 30, 34 questions was, oops. Are you guys there? No. Whoops, I think I dropped. Oh, yeah, I like it. Oh, no. Okay, so I'm wondering if... 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Are we good on the number? I wonder if um I think we can have ten. Did we didn't have we didn't get to ten people, did we? <laughs> oh my mic is oh, there we go. You can hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um we didn't get to ten people, did we? Four, five, six, seven. We only have seven. I thought I saw some message like there were too many people in there. <clears throat> I think we're okay though. Okay, let's go. Um, can you explain what paramagnetic and diamagnetic was, just in general? I can, I can, absolutely, but just know that it's not on the test. Okay, yeah, I just don't know what that is. Okay. Um, so, hold on a second, let me... <laughs> I never remember good examples, so I'm going to grab something, see if I can find a quick example for you guys. Um, oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, oh, it doesn't have to do with, well, yeah, actually, it is, well, it's not exactly even and odd. It's more like, here, actually, I think, so, if, uh, you said, what was one example? Neon was one example? Okay, so we can use the um, the orbitals diagrams to do this. So helium is going to have one pair of electrons. Neon as another noble gas. So this is this is one s two. This is one s two. So it has this paired, and then it has two s two paired. And it has all of 2p paired. So with these, this is all, these are all diamagnetic right here. Helium and neon should both be diamagnetic because um, they have entirely paired electrons. Okay? Um, lithium, on the other hand, let me see if I can. Um, lithium has its 1s paired, but in its 2s, it just has one electron. So it has an unpaired, so it's paramagnetic. It would it would attract on a magnetic field. Like it would be able to attract, you know, it, which you wouldn't normally think that, but that's what it this the paramagnet paramagnetism versus diamagnetism. This one's supposed to be drawing or attracting. In a magnetic field. Beryllium. Um, beryllium is diamagnetic because it has its 1s2 and its 2s2. Nitrogen is paramagnetic. This is kind of so <laughs> I'm kind of wondering oh because it asked and it gave you several different choices didn't it like I okay I, I know I remember this question now. Right. Okay. All right. That one's good. Okay. So the paramagnetic ones are nitrogen and lithium, and the diamagnetic ones are neon, beryllium, and helium. So does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, the, th okay, repeat that question, the three different principles. Yeah, it's like, uh, off-bow, poly collision, and then one other. Oh, okay. There was one other one, but I don't... Huns. 
Hans rule. Okay, so maybe what I should do is I should erase these and fill them in. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the off bow principle, I like, like to start with off bow because it starts with an A. So think of it like being first. A is first, so off bow is first. So you have to start with the first energy level. So when you fill them in, you have to put one here first before you can put one up in the, the P, right? You gotta do one S first before you can do two S, before you can do two P. If you jump, if, if you were to, this is one S, this is two S, this is two P. So if I put one up here, it's a violation of Hun's rule, or I'm sorry, it's a violation of the off bow principle, or it could represent an excited electron. So, um, so off bow is first energy level first. Start with the lowest energy. You have to fill, fill the lower energy levels before you can fill the higher energy levels. Okay? So that's off bow. The next one I like to go to. Oh, it did it to me again. I think my thumb hit something when I don't want it to. Okay. So the second one that I like to talk about is the Huns rule. Because for this one, you have to put one, let me go ahead and fill these in. You have to put one in each of the energy levels, so um, each of the orbitals before you can pair it up. So it has to be one in each before you can pair it up. So each orbital one before pairing. So I think of off bow and Hans is kind of being partner rules because off bow you have to do the lowest energy levels first before you can do higher energy levels and Hans rule is well once you start filling them you have to put one in each before you can start doing a second one so in my mind those kind of go together okay. and alphabetically it works out really well with the poly exclusion principle being last and when I think of exclusion, it means you can't do the same thing with two electrons. So I can't do that. That's a big note. You can't have two going the same direction. It's just about which direction those arrows are going, basically. All right, thank you. Sure. Um, you mean like with like balancing a, a half reaction, the redox method? Yeah. No, I have a hard time doing that on multiple choice, but you do have to identify oxidation numbers, I believe. I think I have that in here. You have to balance a, You have to balance an equation. Like stoichiometry has you just balancing an equation normally. Do, uh, don't I have an oxidation number one in here? Oh, goodness gracious. Did I delete that one? Sometimes I have all these intentions and then... Oh, I did. I know what happened. See, here's the problem in my mind. Like, there's all these great questions, but then they had they removed stuff from the test. So, for example, you don't have to know the term oxidizing agent or reducing agent. Well, the question that I had, had you doing oxidation numbers to determine the, which one was the oxidation agent? And then I deleted, oh, but there is one. Okay, there is one that you have to know the, the um, oxidation numbers for. Phew, I thought how ridiculous would that be if I got rid of all oxidation reduction? So um, we're gonna come back to like electrochemistry 
the, which is the last unit we'll cover before the AP exam, has a lot of, um, we'll come back to balancing by half reactions because that plays a major part in that unit. Sure. So, uh, oh, why don't I just do it like? So, redox. Redox reactions. And so, you need to make sure that you know your rules. And the rules are in the notes for that unit. Um, things like, uh, let's say that I wrote this equation. H2 plus O2 yields H2O. Well, the oxidation number for H2, an element by itself, is zero. An oxidation number for O2, an element by itself, is zero. Now, once it gets in the compound, then you have to, it's a binary, the more, the more um, electronegative element of the binary compound gets its normal state or normal charge that it would have if it were an ion. So that means oxygen is the more electronegative, so it'll get the negative two. And as a binary compound, they have to be equal to zero because it's a neutral compound and there's two hydrogens. So that means that each hydrogen is a plus one. Um, if I did this though, if I had, um, if I did, uh, let's see, Mg plus KBr, yields mg oh no i'm doing this wrong what did i want to do with that oh i know what i wanted to do sorry let me let me back up now they might give you a, uh, an equation that's already in its ionic form that's what i meant to say because you know how sometimes we have to if we give you a total molecular then you split it up into its net ionic but for this, let's say they give you one that's already, let me just make sure I'm not giving you one that was, okay. I don't want to give you one that's already, it's as an example. CR2, O7, 2 minus, plus, um, maybe we have an, Fe3 plus plus H plus, and then it's going to end up giving you something like um, Cr3 plus plus Fe2O3. I mean, this is kind of, oh, wait, no, actually, it would probably be the same. I, you know, it's always a pain when I try to make stuff up on the fly. Uh, we'll, we'll make it plus uh, H2 over here. Now, there should be another F over here, but we're going to know that for a second. The point is, is that this is a monatomic ion, so it's automatically going to have whatever its charge is. So this is a plus 3, and this is a plus 1. In this case, though, the overall is going to have to be equal to negative 2, because as a, as a comp, as a, I'm sorry, polyatomic ion, it now has a charge, so it has to be equal to that. So that means that we, it's also a binary one, so the oxygen gets its normal charge, which is negative 2. There are 7 of them. That's negative 14. Um, so what number plus 14? Negative 14 equals negative 2. Positive 12 divided by 2 means that each chromium is plus 6. This monatomic ion right here, Cr3+, plus, it's going to get its normal, which is plus 3. And then the H2O, you get a negative 2 and a plus 1. So I didn't do this entirely right. Uh, I should have done with iron. Oh, maybe I could, I could do this, Fe2 plus or something like that for a final one. Because what's happening is the plus six, oh, I didn't even do that right. If this was a redox, okay, if I was really clever, if I wanted to make this a redox, I would probably make this actually Fe3 plus and make this one Oh, didn't mean to. Fe2 plus. Oh, 
Okay. So then what happens is these oxygens, I'm sorry, these chromiums, this went plus six to plus three. So did it gain or did it lose electrons? To go from plus six to plus three, it gained electrons. It gained negatives. Its oxidation number went down. So if it gained electrons, that's the GER. So that means it's reduction. This is a this is a reduction right here. And over here, we want Fe two plus. Um, man, we went from plus two to plus three. And so here we lost electrons because it got more positive. So this is the oxidation. So reduction, oxidation number goes down and in oxidation, the yeah, oxidation number goes up. Okay. Are you kind of following that? Yes, I am. Okay. So you need to be able to identify oxidation numbers of, of all the species in the equation. And then you need to identify, and then you need to be able to understand that if it gained electrons, there was a reduction happening. And if it lost electrons, oxidation was happening so that you could identify, you know, like, oh, the, the dichromate ion was being reduced to Cr3+, plus, and the iron 2 plus ion was being oxidized to Fe3+. Plus. All right. Other questions? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So sometimes mole fraction you can see it being uh, written with the funny X, like, almost like the chi, I guess it is a chi, huh? So chi is equal to the N of whatever the gas is over the total number of moles. Or as you just said, Caitlin, we could have the partial pressure of the gas over the total pressure. They're the same thing. Well, I would say that that the units happen to be kind of grouped because of the way that I was creating the test. There is some shuffling, um, and but they are not in the order of one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, some of them are close, but but for the most part, they're a little mixed up. But they but the units are tend to be grouped. Sure. Any other questions? Uh, can you explain shielding again? Because I'm like, I forgot about shielding. Sure. Uh, shielding. Okay. Um, is that on there? Okay. So when you have shielding, that means that, um, so you have your, your protons, right? All right here. And shielding is you just have these other energy levels. So the energy levels are going out. 
And it depends on the trend as to how it plays in. But so for example, with ionization energy, the IE, ionization energy, um, that's the energy required to remove electrons. Well, the more energy levels there are between your outermost electron and your nucleus, that is shielding and it's making it easier. It's lowering the ionization energy because it's further away. There are more energy levels between the nucleus and the outermost electron. If you are talking about, um, well, if you're talking about electronegativity, the ability to attract an electron, it's kind of the same thing. The further out it is, the harder it is for the nucleus to attract that electron. So it's, its electronegativity is much lower because that electron is so far out, away from it, away from the nucleus. So shielding is all about, about creating barriers between the nucleus and the outermost electrons. So does that help you with shielding? Yes, thank oh, you. Okay, sure. Molarity of acids and bases when there's more than one hydrogen. Yes, and absolutely. That plays in. Okay. Solutions. Okay, so if you're dealing with something like, more often than not, it's something like H2SO4. And if they give you the molarity, they're like, okay, this is three molar. H2SO4, and it's going to react with NaOH. And, um, and you're trying to find the molarity of the NaOH. And let's say they said, okay, you have 50 milliliters of the H2SO4, and you have 50, no. Well, yeah, actually, we could do 50 milliliters. Why not? 50 milliliters of the NaOH. And you're like, oh, then this must be three molar too because they have the same amount, but they are not. Because anytime you they say, okay, you have three molar H2SO4, they give you something that's already polyprotic. What that means is, so, and you're going to do the MAVA equals MBVB. Oops. Mm -hmm. You have to remember that this is moles of acid being equal to moles of base. This is moles of H plus being equal to moles of OH minus. So how many moles of H2SO4 are there in three molar of this? So in order to determine this, you know, you, you do the bridge. Well, you have three molar H2SO4, and I'm breaking this down in a long, but that's okay. And for every one mole of H2SO4, you have two moles of H+. So suddenly it's not really three molar H2SO4, it's really six molar H+. And that is what's gonna go back in the equation up here. So you have six times 0.05, is equal, my horrible handwriting, is equal to whatever the concentration is of the NaOH times 0 0.05 of that. So when you, when you do that, those cancel out. And so really you need six molar NaOH to neutralize three molar H2SO4. My recommendation would be that if you have you know, you have these things going into the equation, you double it before you put it into the equation. Okay. And so then, go ahead. I was just gonna say that coming up, let's say the other side is if, if you didn't know, like you, you know the NaOH, but you don't know the H2SO4, you remember, you, you end up finding the molarity of, or you find the, right, the molarity of the H pluses, 
And then you've got to turn around and run it through the bridge again to get the H2SO4. Okay, so if you, so if you start with the NaOH, then since you're finding polarity of the H+, plus, then you would divide it by two. Right. Let's say we made this three, and then this was the question mark. So this is three, this is your question mark, and you end up with, you know, your, your molarity of your acid ends up being three molar. Well, that's really the concentration of the H+. Plus. So your new bridge would be three molar H+, plus, or, or, well, actually, why don't, I, why don't I actually make it three molar instead of just three moles? So three molar H+, plus, and then for every one mole, Oh no, I'm sorry, for every two moles of H plus, you have one mole of the H2SO4. So if you're finding something that's polyprotic or it has multiple OHs, then coming out the other side, then you know you're gonna to need to divide it by the number of H's or divide it by the number of OHs that are in the, the compound you're trying to find. Sure. Other questions? Um, there's a question on the past exam also for the solutions unit. Mm -hmm. And it's about you have one base of a certain molarity in milliliters and then another base that's like different and it's about when you add them together the concentration of the OH minus a different phase uh different bases oh different bases oh you mean like i think i know what you're saying okay so if i have if i have one molar naoh and i add it to or, and I have, let's say, 100 milliliters, and I'm adding it to um, one molar CaOH2, and I have 100 milliliters, what's my final concentration of OH minus? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Okay. So in this case, similar to what we just did, you need to find the number of total moles. So um, you have the moles of the OH from the NaOH, the moles of OH minus, oops, not a plus. So the moles of OH minus from, from here plus the moles of OH minus from here divided by the total volume. So, so one, one, so that, that one molar times a hundred milliliters. So if you, if we remember molarity equals moles over liters, so moles equals molarity time liters. So the moles from the first one is going to be equal to 1.0 times 0 0.1 liters, which is going to give us 0 0.1 moles. And the moles from number two are going to be equal to... Now, this is where you have to double it. So you should see the two right here and say, oh, I'm going to need to double the, the molarity. So really, it's 2.0 molarity times 0 0.1 liters to give me 0 0.2 moles. So then I'm going to have... Um, 0 0.1 moles plus 0 0.2 moles divided by the total volume, which is 0 0.2 liters. So I'm left with 0 0.3 moles over 0 0.2 liters. And then your answer is probably going to be something like um, in molarity. So 0.3 divided by 0.2, isn't that 1.5 molarity? So that's your answer. Okay. Good question. Do we need to know anything like 
like with solubility? No. The thing about solubility is since they're not having you memorize the solubility rules anymore, you don't have to identify what's going to make a precipitate out of that unless they unless they give you a chart. I don't have anything like that. I don't have anything like that on my test. What a question they could ask you though is um Let me see if I have anything like that. It would be more like, I, I have a question that's, sorry, hold on a second. Let me just take a double check or take a look and see. Um, I, I have a question kind of like that, but it's more like if you, if you react, it's a stoichiometry. So all they're, they're really going to focus on is the stoichiometry. So when, when you're talking about solutions, you know, if things react together, and you're gonna you're gonna precipitate out all of an ion. So um, I don't have a good example in front of me, but the idea is that if you're given two substances and you're gonna combine them, they usually give you in the same way that we did the last one. They're gonna give you the molarity, or they're they're gonna give you the concentration and they're gonna give you the volume. So you need to find the number of moles that will react. So you can find how much actually reacts. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Um, let me pick a good example. If they have, I don't have a great example, but if you have NaCl plus AgNO3, and they tell you that, that you have, the NaCl is has a concentration of uh, a molarity of only because I keep doing 0 0.1 molarity and you have 100 milliliters and for the silver nitrate you have 0 0.05 molarity and this is not a good example but I don't I don't can't think of something else at the moment and you have 50 milliliters so what you're going to end up doing is you, and they want to know, and, it, and they're going to say, we want to precipitate out all the silver as AGCL. How much will you have when this is done? So what you would do is you need to find the number of moles. So 0 0.1 times 0 0.1, right? 0 0.1 times 0 0.1 gives you 0 0.01 moles of the Cl minus. Or I'll put the CL minus right here. So do you follow that so far? Yeah. Okay. And then 0 0.05, 0 0.05 times 0. Point, is it 0 0.05 again? Oh, good Lord. <laughs> um, I picked a doozy. Uh, 0 0.025. Is it 0 0.025? Yeah. Uh. 25, there should, one, one two, more zero. there should be one more zero. Yeah, it's 0 0.0025. Oh, okay. I cheated with the calculator. Hey, that's okay. Hopefully, it, I, I don't think, I don't think any of the problems are like this exactly. <laughs> it's a 0 0.0025. All right. Did I put too many zeros in there now? <laughs> hopeless. I am absolutely hopeless. We've lost the ability to do simple math. Yes, this is so true. Okay, so 0 0.0025. So now, and this is of the AG+. Plus. So when you look at this, you're like, oh, okay. So I can only make, this is my limiting reactant now. So I can only make this much AGCl. So my answer is going to be 0 0.0025. And it's going to precipitate out as a solid. So you are not dividing by the volume because... If you could divide by the volume, that would have a concentration. And solids do not have concentrations. Okay. So it could be a stoichiometry problem like that. Um, okay. My problems are, are stoichiometry, like, well, and I didn't do stoichiometry there. I really just found the moles and, and reacted them together. But um, there's going to be a problem that's... Um, it's a longer problem. It, you will need to do a bridge for that. You know, you 
you're given a mass or you're given the um you're given molarity and you you're gonna run it through one or two different reactions and run it through the whole bridge to see how much we'll end up you'll end up with at the end of the reaction. I I, I don't think if I give any more, I, I don't want to give it away, but the idea is that you're you're needing to You know, you're doing stuff like, well, I have I have this molarity, or I have this many moles of something, and and so I'm going to need to 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 cancel out the things as I go down, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. I think in my effort to try to help prepare you guys, I might be confusing. <laughs> this is not a good thing. <laughs> it's almost break. It's all good. This is true. I would say this, and, and I and I feel that I can I can say this with some degree of con confidence that this test is is going to be fairly easy in comparison to most of the tests. I don't know if it's easier than this last test because everyone did so well on it, but I feel like you're going to get a higher grade than your lowest test grade so far this semester. And so it's things like let's pretend. For your guys' sake, that you have a your lowest grade on all the tests is a sixty-five, and then um, you end up getting on this test. Let's say, and there's going to be a curve, but I don't know how great that curve is going to be. If it's easy, a lot of people get good grades. It might be hard to make a curve, but um, and your your grade on this next test is a seventy-five. Well, it's ten, so it's already higher than your lowest test grade. So it's already going to bring up your, it should bring up your average a little bit, but it's going to change this one to 75. So it's going to be 10 here. So this is, it's almost like getting an 85. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I don't know. I think, I think that it's going to be more helpful. I started, I started trying to crunch some numbers and see what would happen to some people's grades. And I think that it'll be, be pretty beneficial. In the off chance that this does end up being our lowest grade, do you still have to change our other lowest grade? Wait, you're saying if if this test ends up being your lowest test grade? Yeah, would you still change our other lowest test grade? What was before? Oh no, I wouldn't change it down. I, I would I would never change your scores in the, um, adversely. Okay, just wanted to double check. Yeah, that's just not nice. <laughs> Are you in Follies at all tomorrow? <laughs> um, 